welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. I'm trying to reach 250 patrons. There's currently 220 patrons supporting. So if you want to support the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media, please do take action now and support the Tough Girl Podcast. Please visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. Today, I'm absolutely delighted. We're going to be speaking to Jen Ben who is 40 years old. She's a full-time writer, full-time athlete, and full-time mum to two younger children. Jen's now going to share more, a little bit more about her life. I work with my husband, Sim, um, and we've written quite a few outdoor adventure guidebooks. So we've written Wild Running, um, and we just had the second edition of that out. Um, and we've got the Adventurous Guide to Britain, um, a couple of walking books, um, and then I contributed to the brilliant Waymaking um, anthology last year. So, yeah, work is writing, going out, finding routes, great running routes, walking routes, climbing, mountain biking, that kind of thing. Um, and we also do all our own photography. So, um, yeah, it's pretty varied. And then we've got two children, they're five and seven, um, and they're busy and energetic, and they come on all our adventures with us. Um, so we, we quite often have to take it in turns to go running and things, but, but they're always there. Um, and yeah, so I run as well and I've done over 50 marathons and ultras. So that's a really big part of life too. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you. And I know that there's going to be loads of people listening who will just be like, oh my God, your life sounds incredible. You know, <laughs> doing all the adventures and traveling and doing it with your family as well and all the running that you do. So obviously I want to go and talk about sort of each each different section in a little bit more detail. But but let's just find out a, a little bit more about you. Tell us about what life was like growing up for you, what, where you grew up. Were you from a sporty family? Were you outdoorsy? Did you like sports at school? Um, I've always been really outdoorsy. I spent most of my childhood in the garden, up trees, um, that kind of thing. I learned to to ride a bike really early on and I was given a lot of freedom to um, just go out and have my own adventures, which I think is really important. I was always climbing massive trees. I'd probably freak out if my kids were climbing at the moment. But um, um, And I grew up in London until I was 10 and then we moved to Herefordshire, which is like the least populated county in the country. So um, that was a big change. Um, and so the kind of my teenage years I grew up with views over to the Black Mountains um, and yeah I was always out running and, and things and it was kind of my escapism um, and school was always a bit <laughs> boring <laughs> for me um, and I did running at school but I didn't really do any other any other sport at school but running has always been there it's always been like whenever there's been an up or a down in life kind of running's been there to be like my headspace and my me time and more recently becoming a mum it's something I did all the way through pregnancy and as soon as I could after having the kids. So, um, yeah, always been a runner. Um, and so more more recently got back into mountain biking and climbing since the kids have got a bit older. Oh, there's like there's like three different avenues I want to go down. And it's a real struggle <laughs> trying to figure out, like, what should I focus on first? But <laughs> let, let's talk about let's talk more about the running then. So, yeah, you've always sort of ran. When did you start getting into marathons and ultra marathons? Because, you know, doing 50 is absolutely incredible. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I started running sort of competitively in my early 20s. I had a big car crash. Um and broke lots of things I couldn't walk for a bit and then when I sort of came back from that I just realized how much of a privilege it is to be able to run um and I'd always done it kind of as a as a bit of a hobby but I started training um and doing marathons so the first marathon I did was the Snowdonia marathon um and that was quite a baptism of fire <laughs> um I got terrible cramp coming down the last hill and that was in 2003 so I've kind of been running them regularly since then um the longest ultra <clears throat> i did the race of the stones which is 100k a couple of years ago um and that was probably a little bit too soon after my son was born so um that was hard work <laughs> um so now i just do them when i when when there's one that fits in with life really i think um expecting sim and the kids to hang around while i run all day is um it's a lot to ask and and we try and take it in turns and be quite equal with with our racing um, and try and t- t- like tie it in with a bit of a holiday for the rest of us so 
so yeah been doing it a while um most recent one was the Imber Ultra which is up on Salisbury Plain which was earlier on this year and that was amazing it's really local to us and it's it's like a proper old school race it's like it's like how I remember races when I started running um and it's our local running club and it's 33 miles around Salisbury Plain um and it was just brilliant it was the day that Storm Freya hit and there's just no st- shelter up on the plain at all um so it was it was a bit of a battle and I got lost a lot and wore the wrong shoes and did all the wrong things but it was it was a fantastic race and, and um yeah gonna go back next year and try and do it better I think running is obviously like an incredible part of your life what why do you enjoy running so much what is it about it I think it's it's the availability of it like time is always short um and with running you really can just just put your shoes on and get out the door and and half an hour if you've got half an hour and you're a climber or a cyclist or something it's just not long enough to get a proper that session in um but with running you can just get out and and it doesn't really matter how long you've got it's also such a good way of um like resetting your mind um we run in lots of different places so wherever we stay we'll go out for a run and explore and it's a way i've always explored kind of a local place wherever we've lived it's kind of a great way of exploring all the local footpaths and getting to know a place um so it's kind of headspace and it's exploring new places and it's kind of that feeling when you when you get out somewhere really beautiful and you kind of find a ridge line or or a beautiful little path along a river or something and there's just nothing quite like it and you stumble along upon wildlife that you wouldn't have seen otherwise and and you kind of get the the sunrises and the sunsets and it's just I don't know it's like <laughs> it's like a, a really rich rich pastime a rich way of of experiencing the world so yeah it's it's really um I think it's totally different from any other sport that I've found um yeah <laughs> I think one of the fascinating things for me is how you've managed to combine like your, your passions so like the running with the writing so one of your first books was wild running which you did in did in 2014 I yeah. mean, how did that come about and how did you manage to to combine the, yeah the running and the writing yeah, um, when um, my first child was born, um, I'd been a postgrad student for a while. And um, because of the way that works and you get a stipend instead of a wage, I ended up not getting any maternity pay. So we ended up in this position where I couldn't work externally because I had a baby and Sim was out working all day. So I was trying to find other ways of, of sustaining us. Um, and we've always loved running and we've always explored places running together so before the kids came along we did lots of mountain marathons and adventure races and that kind of thing um and what we found was that there were lots of guidebooks for mountain bikers and for walkers and things but there wasn't really anything that that was aimed specifically at runners that um that really looked at the terrain you're running along and the the views you get as you're running it's just subtly different from from walking really so um, we were lucky enough to be friends with um, the publishers of, of the Wild Guides and the Wild Swimming Books, Wild Things Publishing. And we just kind of mentioned it in passing that, oh, have a, why don't we write a wild running book? Um, and they took us up on it and said, that, that sounds great. So we were really lucky. Our first publishing deal was just a, a casual conversation. Um, so we actually, we took a bit of time out, went and lived um, with the in-laws and, for, for a few months and um and wrote that, travelled around the country um, and wrote that book. Um, and then after that, everything went back to normal. I was at home with the kids, Sim was out working. And we, we'd kind of had this glimpse of a, a way of life that seemed to work really well for us. Um, but being somewhere where we were paying rent and there were all the bills and things, it's quite hard to get established in writing um, when you've got all those outgoings. So we decided to go and live in a tent for a year um just basically to have an amazing adventure and to reduce our outgoings and see if we could get ourselves established doing something that we really wanted to do all together um, and that worked for all of us and felt balanced rather than you know sim being out at work and missing the kids me being at home and missing doing anything else <laughs> so um yeah we took off with a bell turn and lived um all over the place really we we managed to get a field from a, a local farmer over the summer holidays which was great 
and that was on the Welsh borders. And um, we camped on Dartmoor and we camped up in the Lake District. And we were spending about a month in each place. So we really got to know lots of amazing places and um, lots of the national parks. Um, and it just gave us that that time and space and um, the ability to live very cheaply for, for that length of time. And it turned into about 18 months in the end until we managed to, to get back into a house. But um, but yeah, it really did work. And it, it meant that it gave us the chance to to get established. So now we, we write for magazines and we've we've got a few more books out. So it's now a, a kind of sustainable way of living for us. Oh, I love everything you said about that. <laughs> um, so definitely want to talk about that. But I just, I feel yeah. as though I need to, uh, I want to be really nosy. I just want to find out a bit more about your backstory with um, with how you met your husband and, you know, yeah. how, how you met Sim. Because obviously you've obviously found your your, your partner, but also yeah. somebody who's really on the same page with you with returns to values and the life type of life that you want to live. Because I know... Maybe not everybody they say to their partner. I mean, oh, actually, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, yeah, let's go back. How, how did you meet Sim? What, yeah, what was the story there? Um, we we were both working in a climbing shop in Exeter. Um, and we were both at university and um, working there in, in our holidays. And then we both ended up working there full time after uni. Um, he's actually five years younger than me. So, <laughs> um Love so it, toy was, boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and I was doing, I'd just finished my master's and was kind of trying to set, set myself up um, as a, I, I did uh, podiatry as my degree um, and then sport and exercise medicine as a master's. Um, so I was I was kind of working with runners and things. And then I went into postgraduate research. Um, so throughout that, I was sort of working part-time in the climbing shop. And then Sim started managing the mail order um, and um, took me on as a part-time member of staff. So he was my boss for a bit. Um, <laughs> and we just we just hit it off. We were working in a little office, really busy. And we just worked together really well. Um, we started planning races together and kind of it went from there, really. Um, and yes, I think exactly like you said, the meeting someone who has that that same mindset that kind of it's not all about career and about getting on the on the housing ladder and getting a, a bigger car and, and all that kind of thing for us it was all about the experiences and about spending time together because we were we were working for other people and and you spend so much of your time apart um and especially once we had children like he was working for pretty much during the week, the whole time that they were awake, that, that they were awake, so he'd leave before they woke up and get back after they'd gone to bed, and it just felt like a a non sustainable way of living for us. So, um, so yes, I think I think we've both always kind of grown up doing outdoorsy things. He went to all the ten tours stuff um, in. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the the schools on um, on Dartmoor um, every year they have a big ten tours. Um, like navigation event um and I think I don't know he grew up with that kind of thing so he's always been very confident navigating and and camping out and things um and we also we just had loads of camping equipment so so when it came to the point where we weren't sure we could carry on paying rent and, and living the way we were the one thing we did have was loads of camping equipment and loads of confidence in our ability to camp safely even with small children so um so yeah <laughs> how old were your children in 2015 um our son was six months old when we moved into the tent um and our daughter was just three so <laughs> quite little oh I love this <laughs> I'm just thinking back to like my my niece who's three and my nephew who's about he's about nine months as well yeah yeah so I, I always want to go back to how this conversation evolved I mean I, I get it I understand what you're saying you know you're you yeah. live you're living this life you're paying these bills and actually it you know so it wasn't working but how did how did it yeah how did this where did the idea come from like did it start as a joke or was it yeah sorry <laughs> I'm so glad <laughs> <excited. laughs> yeah I mean I think I think we'd been kind of going along for quite a long time knowing that we weren't happy um with the state that things were in and knowing that we were going to have to either move to somewhere cheaper and less a place we wanted to to bring our our kids in um or we were going to have to 
kind of move move back in with parents, which wasn't really an option. Um, so I think I spent quite a lot of time kind of wrestling in my mind about what, what we could do. And I'm fairly sure I came up with the idea when we were camping. Um, I was just lying there and thinking, actually, this is something we could do longer term. Um, and kind of making that, turning a bit of a crisis into an adventure was something that really appealed. Um, yeah, I wouldn't do it now, I have to say. <laughs> um, but at the time, I, I was, I remember we were camping and I just said, you know, why don't we try and do this for a bit longer, like go on a big adventure? And and initially we're thinking about getting a yurt and trying to find somewhere um, permanent for the year. And we looked into getting yurts and things. Um, but then we actually thought rather than rather than just being in one place for a whole year, um, it would be a really good opportunity to go and explore lots of different national parks. And, and spending a month somewhere, you really get to know it. And especially when you're sleeping on the ground listening to all the owls and and things it's it's a really amazing way of experiencing somewhere so yeah I'm fairly sure it was it was all my idea to begin with but Sim was totally he he just went with it um and yeah it went from there <laughs> and as soon as we'd made that decision all the it just felt like the right thing to do at the time and all those stresses of can we pay rent next month and that kind of thing just kind of disappeared and we had an notice in um, advertised all our furniture and people came and took all our stuff away <laughs> and it was a weird experience we ended up sitting on the floor that last like the last evening we were there and all our stuff had gone and um and we had this this big tent and a wood burner and everything we needed and it was yeah quite quite an amazing experience <laughs> what was the reality like sort of getting out there and I mean it's I, I, I love it I mean sim- simplifying your life to a whole new level but yep. then suddenly you are in a tent in a field with a three-year-old, a six-month-old, um, yep. s- small space. Uh, I obviously want to know what happened about bathrooms and, the <laughs> and <laughs> toilets and electricity. Yeah. And yeah, what was reality like for you? I think I think it's important to underline but before we, we embarked on this, we do have um, really, Sim's parents are incredibly supportive and we kind of knew that if anything went wrong or if the kids got ill or anything like that, we could show up at any time of the day or night with them. And I, I think that was a really important thing to know. We had a backup plan. Um, but with kind of day to day living, the um, we mainly camped on campsites. So especially over the winter, campsites are very cheap, very quiet um, and for the first, I think we started in November. For the first three months, we had a wood burner. So we had a, a big bell tent with a hole in the roof with, with the flue going up. Um, so we had a wood burner in, in the tent. Um, and that worked OK, but it was a bit smoky at times. And trying to keep a three-year-old away from the wood burner all the time was a bit stressful. So after that, we tended to stay places where there was either electric hookup um, or... So either campsites with electric hookup or the um, the place we managed to, the field we managed to get over the summer for a couple of months that had electricity that we could run a, an extension cable to. And then we got um, a little electric heater, which made all the difference. Um, and you could just put it on in the tent and it would warm everything up. And it was great and it was much safer and much cleaner than the wood burner. So the wood burner was kind of a nice romantic thing to start with, but it was actually a bit hard work longer term. Um, I think the hardest bit was probably March, April time. It was quite a it was quite a warm winter, which was good, but it was quite a wet spring, and we just ended up with so much mud right outside the tent. So we ended up having to put pallets and things down, so we didn't didn't get too muddy. So I think the mud and like days and days of rain is the hardest thing because it's quite hard to to entertain, especially a three year old. A six month old doesn't really care very much, but the three year old is it's quite hard to keep them entertained when there are days of it being rainy outside and it's hard to dry anything out. So, um, yeah, the campsites in the winter are weird. (laughs) You get quite a lot of people who are, who are kind of long-term campers. So the the campers that are over the the campsites that are open over the winter, you do get the people who live in a, in a van or a caravan or a tent long-term. So it's quite interesting characters we met. Um, an ex-surgeon from the, the NHS who had just 
jacked it all in and gone and lived in his van with his dog permanently and things. So it's a really interesting um, human stories as well. And um, we met over the year. Um, and yeah, and over the, over the warmer months, camping's just great. So on Dartmoor, you can wild camp legally. It's one of the few places, well, it's the only place in England you can wild camp legally. So um, over the summer, we did quite a bit of wild camping, um, just single nights in different places. Um, at home, my son's just come in. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, little man. Okay, I'll be out in a minute. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I think I, I did think we've done amazingly well without him coming to find me. <laughs> That's okay. But, yeah, so um, mainly campsites with, with electric hookup were a real saviour, especially trying to work as well. Um, and then a couple of times um, we did we got a, a barn in Cornwall um, in the winter because uh, the kids got, got colds and we were all feeling a bit like we needed a, an indoor space. So we did, we stayed in a barn, um, a barn conversion for a bit. Um, and then at one point our tent blew down and got really damaged in a storm. So we did go back to um, Sim's parents for a, a few nights. So like our deal was that, that we wouldn't put anyone at risk and we wouldn't put anyone's health in danger. Um, so anytime we, any of us got ill, we we tended to go and find somewhere with a, a warm bath and, <laughs> and and central heating. Um, but I, we we did over three hundred nights in the tent. So yeah, it did. It was it was a, a pretty big year. <laughs> How did you manage? Um, I'm not quite sure what the the right word is here, but in terms of, I don't know if it's it's not status and it's not ego. Um, but in terms of making the adjustment or having society's view on you, I mean, I don't know how much that changed. I don't know if your if your friends were supportive. You know, for me, when I moved back in with my parents, it was like, oh my god, I'm th- you know, I'm 36 years old. Oh, actually, no, I would have been 30, 33 when I moved back in with my parents. Being four weeks, yeah. four, four years later, still here, and there is that sort of uh, stigma. Maybe is it, what did you feel any? stigma for for living in a tent for for this amount of time like how did how did you manage that side of things yeah we we actually got surprisingly few um negative comments I mean it was something I definitely worried about before we did it and then the the first few nights um I remember the first night we stayed under under canvas there were weird noises going on like as if there was somebody creeping around and I was just lying there thinking what on earth have we done like I'm, I'm here with responsibility for these children and um and and it was just a fox in the end so it was fine um and I think I I justified it by by thinking that people go on camping holidays for a week or two all the time um so it's, it's a bit of an extended one of those and I also think we, like I wrote a blog at the time and got so much positive feedback about that because I think our story of being kind of stuck in that, on that treadmill of having to earn enough money to pay somebody else for a house you live in and still not having the quality of life that you really want for all of you. Um, and I think that rings true with so many people that actually doing something a bit extreme <laughs> um I, it, I think it's justified in a way. I think I think people understood exactly why we'd done it. Um, we had some people, mostly it was concern really, rather than nobody outwardly said to us, this is really irresponsible what you're doing and, and you shouldn't be doing it. Um, but quite a lot of people were concerned, especially when there was bad weather. We got messages saying, are you okay? Do you need somewhere to stay? That kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think... I think at the time it was it felt like the only option we had um and yeah people were really positive about it I think my parents were a bit worried I think they were worried from a safety point of view um but you never hear about anything happening to people who've gone on a camping holiday so sort of rationalizing it um I felt like it was a a reasonable level of of risk if there if there is much risk um and again like having Having that backup of being able to go in and crash at Sam's parents was it was just so important and it meant that it took that edge of irresponsibility that that could have been there off us a bit. Um and we did several festivals and things and talked about what we were doing and 
and it's been the one thing we've done that people have just been really drawn to and really interested in um and yeah and and luckily um having spent that time out it's worked and it has made us able to to live how we wanted to live and and it's still not easy it's still like it's as you know that like the the writing life is such an uncertain one and you're always having to go out there and 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 kind of find new work and it's it's never a definite but but at the moment it's it's working it's sustainable um and I think if there were people who who um weren't sure about what we were doing or doubted us or thought we were responsible then then hopefully the fact that we've kind of come around and and we're now back living in a house and and it kind of worked in the way that we hoped it would work um, I'd love to talk to you more about sort of adventuring with with children as well. So you've talked about running and writing and you know, running being a big part of, of both of your lives. Yeah. H- how did that change once you had um, once you had your little ones? I think the main change is that we now have to take it in turns to run. So unless we're somewhere like we don't, we're, we're not very good at getting childcare. <laughs> um, so so really the only place we can both go for a run is at Sim's parents and they look after them and we go for a run. But the vast majority of the time since we've had the kids, we've taken it in turns to run. Um, early on when they were little, I'd get out really early um, while they were like the, the couple of hours they'd sleep first thing in the morning. I'd go for a run then, especially when Sim was working. So I'd have to fit that in before he went. Nowadays, we tend to split the day up. So I will work and run in the morning and then Sim will work and run in the afternoon. Um, and the other one will have the kids so that works pretty well and um, we homeschool at the moment so um so we're also kind of educating them <laughs> so the but that, again that works really well and we're both I've, I've lectured at uni and and sims a, a, a qualified teacher so um so it's something we both love doing and, and both passionate about so um yeah, I think with, with running, taking it in turns since <laughs> since the kids arrived has been a, a big one, and we can't race together at the moment. Uh, but it's only temporary, and like they're growing up fast, and they'll be more and more happy to to kind of go off and and spend weekends with grandparents and things. So so hopefully at some point in the future we can go back to doing mountain marathons and things. Yeah. You, you talked about race to the stones, which you did sort of quite soon after after your son. Yeah. How was that? And was that a race that you'd already sort of booked in and wanted to do? Or was it something that you booked in afterwards? And and how did you manage sort of the training while, you know, while having sort of a, a, a new child? Um, it was something I did at very short notice. We um, we were, we got into conversation with Threshold and, and they said, well, come and run it. And, and, and we were going to write about it. And I'd never run that far before and it was just a I just thought I want to kind of prove to myself that I can I can still take on a big challenge you know even after not not soon after having it it was was probably a within the first year um and so I didn't get loads of time to train and while I run regularly I hadn't done enough long runs really (laughs) so I did as many as I could and I think I had about five weeks before the race And actually, the biggest problem on race day was it was the first time I'd been away from him for any length of time. So I had to be on the bus at five in the morning and I didn't finish until well into the evening. So it was a long time to be away from him, which I found quite hard. And I was actually still breastfeeding at the time. So I think the thing that hurt the most when I finished was my boobs. (laughs) (laughs) So so, uh, not feeding all day. I think when you when you hear about uh, Jasmine Paris and other amazing mums who do this kind of thing they do feed en route and I think that would have been a really good idea because it does get uncomfortable otherwise <laughs> so yeah all these things they didn't tell you and yeah so I think it was a bit soon probably in retrospect and I'd done marathons before and that was fine it's just kind of a bit more of a manageable length of time but to spend spend all day out there and I really struggled with my motivation when I was out there because I didn't really want to be away from him and um and that's just something you don't want to be going through your head halfway through an ultra is I don't really want to be here. So I did get to the finish and it was an amazing experience. It was an amazing race and they were so supportive. But yeah, I think I'd <laughs> ideally have left it a bit longer or perhaps met up with Sim and them on, on route. But it's a lot to ask of them to hang around as well. So, so it's all about balance now, I think, and um, really feeling like it's a race you really want to do 
uh, rather than I used to race most weekends, whereas now it's I really consider whether it's a race I really want to do before I go and do it because it's putting it's putting them out as well. So, yeah, balance nowadays, I think. Yeah. How did you mentally flip that switch then when you're running along thinking, I really don't want to be here doing yeah. this and I've still got another 30 miles to go? <laughs> um, <laughs> I really, that, that race, I really struggled. I will sometimes, I'm, I love audiobooks, so I'll sometimes listen to, on the Inver Ultra recently, I hit a bit of a low patch with, with about three hours to go. And um, I was getting towards the end of Bleak House, <laughs> my audiobook, so I put that in. It was a really exciting bit towards the end, and I found that really good. Like, I don't listen to music when I'm running, but I listen to audiobooks. So I find that really good, like you just get lost in a story, and it it kind of takes your mind off the the, the pain and things. But then once you get towards the end, that, that takes over that kind of, I'm nearly at the finish feeling so so I think I think listening listening to stories when when, and the low points really helps one of the books that you've written is amazing family adventures um you and your husband fun days out and action-packed weekends tell us more about that so how can you continue going on adventures when you when you do have a young family yeah that was a book with the national trust that we wrote um and it was just such a lovely project because National Trust places are so well set up for families. So you'll go to somewhere and it's kind of adventurous but safe, which is which is really good. Um, when you've got young children, going on adventures can be really stressful. Like everything is a is a hazard, and there are dogs everywhere and cliff edges and unfenced water and things. So so actually going to National Trust places, we'd always felt was one of the it's one of the few places we felt we could relax and just let the kids do their own thing and they've always got baby changing and they've always got cafes so we can always get ice cream and coffee for us and things so I think going to places that are well set up for families even though it goes against I think for both Sim and I going to places where the adventure is a little bit more organized goes against our adventurous spirits a little bit actually when you have small children having those those things there makes it just so much more enjoyable so I think when they're younger um going places that are set up for families is really good and so for researching for amazing family adventures we basically had to go to these places run around in the woods climb trees test out the cafe make sure the ice cream was good (laughs) go to the playground so it was it was such a great project for us and and I think also with the National Trust, there are all these conservation messages. Um, so so we'd go to places and we'd look at the different flowers and different birds and trees and things. So it felt like each place is like a learning experience as well as an adventure and together time and things. So that was a really good project for us. And um, and hopefully the book is, um, it's, it's adventures that you can do anywhere. So um, you don't have to go to National Trust places to do them. But we've then um, recommended several National Trust places that are good for doing that specific adventure. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really good good place to start. Um, and I think when the kids were really little, we used to just chuck them in their slings and walk up mountains and it was really easy. But then they start wanting to walk and they start getting a bit more adventurous and a bit more disobedient. And then things get really a bit more um, <laughs> fraught. So... So we went up to um, Yes Tour on Dartmoor at the weekend, which is one of only three mountains on Dartmoor. So it's 619 metres. And our um, seven-year-old walked the whole way up and the whole way back down again. And the five-year-old needed a bit of carrying. Um, and that was all fine. But then we get to the top, there's, there's a big rocky bit and he likes to stand up and it's really windy and <laughs> things. So it's quite stressful. So I think that especially when you're somebody who's used to getting outside and, and climbing and doing lots of things where you've only got yourself to look after. When you've then got a kid to look after as well, it can make adventures quite stressful. So, yeah, that, that balance between allowing them to be exposed to a little bit of risk, which is hugely important, and not completely freaking out yourself is quite quite important as well. Um, I've definitely found that with when you become particularly a mum even if even if you're still getting out and doing lots it's much harder to tell anyone about that and I went to a women in an adventure evening like a a presentation 
once when I had a very small, one of them was very small. And they were wondering where all the all the women of in their 30s basically go and why people aren't making films about adventures and and I think actually when you're when you become a parent if you manage to be a parent who has adventures that's quite a lot to deal with (laughs) and then so then to make a film about it or tell anyone about it becomes even harder it's like one step too far so I think there are probably more mums out there doing things but we just don't hear about it because it's so hard it's so hard to tell anyone and also there's the the whole privacy thing so I, I really try not to put my kids on social media too much like a little bit's good but, but I really try not to put them on there too much so I think sometimes people are surprised we have kids because I don't put them on social media very much so it's, it's also quite hard to to put that side of the story out there and to be inspiring when you don't really want to put them on there too much if you see what I mean so, so what advice would you have for for new mums or new mothers or, or or women out there who who do have children or fathers out there who do have children um you know, what advice and tips would you have for them to to encourage them to go out and do more adventures with their family I think with especially with younger children really getting through the door is the is the main obstacle and getting everyone ready and, and getting them outside and once you're outside they they're so good at making their own adventures like little kids will look look under stones and find insects and that's an adventure for them and I think not aiming too big is really important and going and finding like asking them what they want to do so when they're a little bit older like ours as they are now if we if we tell them we're going out and we're going for a walk or something they will they will instantly put their barriers up and they don't want to help they don't want to go out it's not like they're busy playing and they don't want anything to do with it whereas if we if we ask them what they want to do, where they like to go, and they have an input into it, they're much more likely to be on board. So, so anything where they have control. So a lot of places have like waymarked walks where they can follow arrows and things, and that's really good. So you you say right, we're doing the purple walk today, and they get to run ahead and spot the arrows, and and then they feel like it's an adventure for them rather than they're getting dragged on an adventure with us, which makes a huge amount of difference. I say spare clothes are really important because they always get muddy and wet <laughs> and it's really important not to overmanage them when they're trying to get when they're getting muddy and wet because it's part of being a kid and having fun so we always have loads of spare clothes so they can they can get as muddy and wet as they like and then we can just tuck them in and use such clothes. I was gonna say it must be really difficult because I, I mean I know I don't have children but I can feel that elements of control like no don't do yeah. that don't get that oh my god watch out for that <laughs> yeah I, I hear myself and I think just I just need to back off a little bit and let them be kids because especially if you are camping or something and it's quite hard to dry things off you just end up not wanting them to get anywhere near a puddle or anything <laughs> I think um being a bit relaxed about things like sweets is really important when you're out and about as well because we, we try and get them to eat healthily when we're at home but then when we're going to go and walk up a mountain like if, if we're doing something like running an ultra, we eat sweets nonstop. So we, we sort of figure if, if we're going up a mountain or something, that's the one time when we don't have to be too stressed about what they're eating as well. So so they tend to, I think kids run around a lot and then like crash. <laughs> so so it's really important just to keep them keep them topped up with snacks and, and, um, and that helps them identify that they're getting hungry as well. So they can always ask for something and always have something. So yeah, regular snacks lots of spare clothes and <laughs> um, carrying them as well especially like our seven-year-old now doesn't want carrying anymore which is good because she's getting quite big but the even our five-year-old sometimes just wants to be picked up and carried for a minute and I think that's if you can do it it's really important that they know there's that option and they're more, much more likely to be up for going somewhere if they know that if they get really tired they'll just get picked up um, and normally we end up picking him up and then about a minute later he'll spot something he wants to do and want to be put down again so um yeah I think that's it really and and yeah making sure they get involved in planning yeah and maybe packing a few of their own things um ours have got a couple of little rucksacks so they pack their own snacks and toys and things and then they feel like they're they're part of the whole planning adventure because they're, they're not that different from grown-ups we love the planning bit of adventures as well so um 
yeah, just get them involved, really. <laughs> I, say, I like the idea of just knowing there's somebody there who could pick me up. <laughs> yeah, that would be so <laughs> that would be, nice, be, so, be super fun. <laughs> what was it like sort of leaving tent life behind? So, you know, 18 months living under a tent, completely changing your your way of life and um, and then to, to move it back into, um, into four walls with a roof. How was that adjustment period? Were you ready for it at that point? Did you miss tent life? Or, um, you know, yeah, how's that all going? I think when we actually managed to get get a house, <laughs> I just wanted to to <laughs> um, like lie on the floor and just be in the house. It was I, I'd more than had enough of not necessarily the tent life, but just the uncertainty and mm. not having a space of your own and a bit of privacy. And it's quite one of the the big things about living with just a sheet of canvas between you and the outside is when you have a bit of a meltdown, everybody hears <laughs> and, and hopefully it doesn't happen too often, but it's, there's just, there's just no privacy on a campsite. And when you're there for a couple of weeks, it's not so much of a problem, but kind of having to live like that all the time is, is sort of oddly restrictive, really. You can't kind of sing in the shower and things. Um, so being in a house, the main thing was just having a bit of privacy and a bit of um, just, just your own space um and we've got a little garden so the kids can play really safely in the garden and that's amazing so I think there there were positives and negatives and I think the positives are having our own space and having the garden and having just even now even a couple of years later still turning the tap on and water comes out and having like heating and and a loo that's indoors and things I still appreciate it which is good because it's something we we just take for granted so easily so yeah just having and just having your own <laughs> toilet <laughs> and it is something we just grow up with in this country yeah. most of us and 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 all these things that are just there at the like a switching light switches on and things and and it's so exciting for a few weeks but then it is it just everything is much more hard work um and it 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 does leave you with a little bit less energy for other things I think so but I also think I often feel a bit shut off in a house because being so immersed in nature was amazing. Like having all the bird song all the time and and you can hear what the weather's doing when you're in a tent. Um, like listening to, I remember we were in the Lake District and there was a storm coming and you could hear the rain like thundering down the valley before it got to us. And that kind of experience of, you never hear that in a house. Um, and and I do sometimes feel like with all like walls and double glazing and all that kind of thing, we're so cut off from the space we, we're in. Um, so I, I've definitely found I like to have the windows open and things so I can hear outside a lot more. Um, and when we're camping, the kids always sleep better as well. I think there's that like gentle background noise, isn't there, often. And, and they still sleep better in a tent than they do in a house. Um, so, yeah, I miss I miss that kind of feral feeling yeah. of being really immersed in in the place you're in um and in some of our national parks it's such an amazing thing to be immersed in so um yeah but but nowadays we can always go camping whenever we really want that we can go, <laughs> go and sleep in the tent um and then retreat back indoors afterwards and working is so much easier now because having to find wi-fi in cafes and libraries and things especially when you've got small children screaming about is is quite hard work so so um, being able to work from home is amazing. <laughs> I, I love one of your your most recent books, actually, in 2018, The Adventurer's Guide to Britain, which I think is, you know, absolutely fantastic because... Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> so so many people think that... Uh, and I have to say, I fall into this habit as well, that I'll, not that I can't have adventures in Great Britain, but it's almost like I want to have adventures further afield. I feel as though I need to travel, uh, you know, to far fun places around the world to go on an adventure and that's almost like my definition of adventure yeah but you created this guide the adventurer's guide to britain um tell everybody a little bit more about about that book yeah i think we spent we spent so long exploring britain and and every time we go away we find we find things we hadn't realized existed um like last year we went up to scotland and we went we went and explored the islands and there were places and people and ways of life that, even though we're in the same country, are so far away from our normal everyday experience that it, it is just like going 
<laughs> going somewhere else. Um, and I think we spent we've spent a lot of years exploring Britain, and we just wanted to put together a bit of a a bit of a tick list, I suppose, of places and experiences um, that were just amazing, and and that are that really sum up the type of adventures you can have in this country as well. Like we've got so much water and um, and you know, different types of rock to climb, and so we've it's a mixture of scrambling and running slash walking so the the running or walking routes you could do either there's mountain biking um got a little bit of road biking as well so there's just so many different things and kayaking wild swimming um and although it's a it's a small country there's, there's just such a variety of landscapes and kind of potential for adventure so we just wanted to i mean it just scratches the surface really mm. it's, it's the whole of the country and we could do that size book for every county really um but it's and we hoped it would kind of inspire people to go somewhere, try the adventure we've recommended. But then we've given them a lot of other information about each place um, and other possible adventures that you could have there. So, um, yeah, we're very we're very keen on rather than having like a tick list where you go and I don't know do the the highest peak in in how many different places that you base yourself somewhere and explore everything that area has to offer kind of a much more sustainable way of of adventuring so you support a local community and you really get to know that place um and and i think that's a much more enriching way of of adventuring really um and it's sort of something we all need to start doing a bit more rather than just like driving between different places and, and things so yeah we, we we just wanted to put together some of the best experiences we've had because um I think the running books we really enjoy but it, it kind of misses out the the bits we do in between the running like the mountain biking and swimming and kayaking and things so so what, yeah it's it's all in there <laughs> what was the most su- sort of surprising adventure that you went on which almost like you weren't really expecting or you thought oh I didn't even realize that this was a thing like I didn't know that we could do this I think the hours of silly were quite a surprise for us because we spent a lot of time in Devon and Cornwall and sort of assumed that the Isles of Scilly was just a bit of an extension to Cornwall. Um, but it is like being somewhere else entirely and they're just so great for adventures. So you can, um, they've got like white sandy beaches so you can swim in this clear sea just off the beach. You can run around to so a lot of the islands are easily circumnavigable. So you can do a trail run all the way around the outside of each of the islands um you can kayak between them like some of them are uninhabited so you can like within a couple of hours of on a boat from Cornwall you can be kayaking out to uninhabited islands and watching puffins and things and seals and and it's it's just it's just like a little microcosm of adventure so I think that was probably probably one of our um, biggest surprises was going there and and then um, yeah, there's just there's just so much there. It's just little islands, but and everything's just subtly different. What adventures or holidays, adventures stroke holidays, have you got coming up um, in the coming months? And uh, we're back up to Scotland um, next week. Uh, we'll probably go for about a month, I think, because we need to be back for we're doing top of the gorge festival down in in Cheddar. Um, so I think we'll spend between now and then exploring more of Scotland. Um, it was the first time I'd really been like I've been on trips to do do various things, but it was the first time I'd really been and spent a lot of time in Scotland last year. And um, it feels like rather than going and ticking things off, we just made our things we wanted to do there much longer. <laughs> so um, yeah, we wanted to get over to the Isle of Egg, um, which just looks wonderful, um, and I think that it's, it's the most eco-friendly island in Britain. I think so. That, that, that that looks fantastic and we'd quite like to get over to the western isles as well which we didn't get to last year out to lewis and harris and and things um and do a bit more scrambling and and exploring the coast so yeah we're quite excited about that yeah. are you are you currently writing another book at the moment we are we've got a couple on the go um we are writing a um a running book for the national trust um which is coming out next year so it's great to work with them again. Um, and we've got a walking book um, with Bloomsbury, who published our Adventurous Guide to Britain 
book and we're doing a family walks book with them as well so a couple of really exciting projects coming up oh fantastic i do i I love this honestly it's it's so (laughs) it's it's so inspiring to hear more you know about your journey and about you know making that really hard decision to go and live you know under canvas for for 18 months to drastically change your life and i'm so pleased that it's all working out for you so um, we, yeah. <laughs> where's the best place for people to find more information out about uh, about your family and uh, you know where can they follow along with the journeys and buy the books worldrunning.net is where you can find um, everything about our wild running book you can buy the book um and that's where we put our running routes and things and adventureplaces.co.uk is our kind of general adventure blog um more about us on there and once we have a bit more time we'll put more of our adventures on there but that's where um things like going to, to find the fossil tree on the island of mull and and wild camping on dartmoor and lots of exciting um hopefully inspiring adventures are on there at the moment so so those are the two best places to go oh jen thank you so much for coming on the Girl podcast to share more about your story and your journey it is so inspiring i'll be making sure yeah. i put all of the links to your social media to the books that you've written to your websites etc so people can come and follow along and hopefully go on more adventures which is what we want everybody to be doing thanks so much for having me on <laughs> Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Jen and it's inspired you to think a little bit more about how you can adventure close to home, whether that's in the UK or whether it's further afield in places like Australia or America. So maybe just have a little look outside and see what is right on your doorstep which you haven't found or discovered yet. So one of the things which helps to spread the word about Tough Girl Podcast is you, my incredible listeners. Thank you so much for telling your friends and family. Um, Another powerful way to do that is actually leaving reviews on iTunes. We're currently up to 188 reviews which is amazing. And I'd obviously love to hit 200. Just going to read out two of the most recent reviews in June. So the first one is hi, hi there. So thank you so much for leaving a five star review. And it says, I am so grateful for your work. The range of voices you are recording are so important and helping me learn about what makes it possible to get out there. I'm really focused on my own adventures now and how to share them to inspire others. Loads of kisses. So thank you so much for taking the time to leave a review. I really appreciate it. And Belina also left a five star review. Can't stop telling everybody about this. Whoop, whoop. Thank you so much. So she goes on to say, I love this podcast. It's so inspiring and it's got me plotting to do my own adventures. I'm always telling friends and colleagues to start listening to it too. The messages from all sorts of women are so positive, even from women who have come across really hard times. I love that it's raising the profile of women and it's such a positive way and in such a positive way. We need more of this in our lives. So a massive thank you um, for taking the time out to leave a review. It really does make a massive difference because obviously, you know, I don't have a marketing budget. It's me, me on my laptop or me on my phone helping to promote and share these incredible stories. There are over 200 episodes now of amazing women, all ages, all backgrounds, doing a whole variety of different challenges. We're coming up to the the fourth year of the podcast. So the 4th of August 2019 is going to be the fourth birthday um, for the Tough Girl podcast. And I couldn't have done it without all of you. So thank you so much for taking the time out to listen and, and support me. I really appreciate it. If you can't find financially support via patreon patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast retweeting commenting sharing sharing on instagram stories telling your friends and family about it telling your work colleagues about it it really does make a massive difference what i mean by that if you if you know somebody is trained to run a marathon for example or they or they want to start going to the gym or they want to get outside more you know nudge them in the tough girl podcast direction because hopefully by listening to those stories it will inspire them to think about what they could do and how they could do it and by hearing other women who've been in a similar situation it will inspire again inspire them and it'll cause this massive positive ripple effect which is what um i'm I'm really going for so a massive thank you to everybody i hope you're having an amazing day wherever you are whatever you are doing um so much more information to come about what's going to be happening over the coming a couple of weeks we've got some incredible guests coming on we're doing a lot of, or I'm definitely doing a lot of special stuff to help celebrate the 4th of August so make sure that you are following along on Instagram stories at Tough Girl Challenges on Facebook at Tough Girl Challenges I'm also on Twitter at underscore tough underscore girl and obviously don't forget to check out the website toughgirlchallenges.com boom a lot of information being sent at you but have an awesome day I will speak to you soon uh, make sure you subscribe new episodes every Tuesday at 7am UK time All right take care lots of love bye